As there is a passage to be made from non-living to living in the physical realm, so also is there a passage from non-living to living in the spiritual. But note the directions the gates point. All of them extend inward toward the large courtyard that represents physical, mortal life. The gates represent choice. No one may choose to be born physically, so there are no gates protruding outward from the outer wall. But once one has entered the courtyard of physical life, there are two destinations to choose between. One can either choose to enter the inner courtyard where the temple is, or he can return to the realm of the non-living. Or, of course, he can just wander aimlessly through the outer court, oblivious to the choices set before him. The question is, can he do this indefinitely? I'm afraid I'm going to have to defer the whole discussion of eternal destinies for a later chapter. Right now, we're merely exploring the architectural metaphors God has laid before us. But you've got to admit, they're intriguing. This, then, is the basic layout of the Millennial Temple Complex. On elevated ground, somewhere north of the main city of Jerusalem, a large outer court surrounds a small inner court in which the temple itself stands. Six gates, or portals, lead inward or outward from the outer court. Guard alcoves are built into the gate structures, and 30 rooms line the inner perimeter of the outer wall. So far, so good, but here's where most Christians' assumptions concerning God's intentions toward the law of Moses begin to fall apart. A door led from the foyer of the inner gateway on the north side into a side room where the meat for sacrifices was washed before being taken to the altar. On each side of this foyer were two tables where the sacrificial animals were slaughtered for the burnt offerings, sin offerings, and guilt offerings. Outside the foyer, on each side of the stairs going up to the north entrance, there were two more tables. So there were eight tables in all, four inside and four outside, where the sacrifices were cut up and prepared. There were also four tables of hewn stone for preparation of the burnt offerings, each thirty-one and a half inches square and twenty-one inches high. On these tables were placed the butchering knives and other implements and the sacrificial animals. There were hooks, each three inches long, fastened to the foyer walls and set on the tables where the sacrificial meat was to be laid. Ezekiel 40, 39 through 43, NLT. What? Animal sacrifices? I thought Christ's sacrifice did away with all that. Sure, the Jews in the Old Testament had to make sacrifices according to the rules laid down in the law to atone for their sins, but Jesus was the Lamb of God. So when the Jews reinstituted animal sacrifices for a short time during the tribulation, they were merely demonstrating, again, that they'd rejected Christ's sacrifice, right? Not right. They were merely being obedient for a change. The Torah said these things were to go on throughout their generations. But why would Yahweh still be interested in animal sacrifices after the reality they represent, the sacrifice of the Messiah, became a historical fact? We need to keep an eye on the big picture. Ask yourself, how were people reconciled to Yahweh between Adam's day and Moses' giving of the law? What were Gentiles, who never heard of Moses, supposed to do to find their way back to God? Why would Yahweh allow the Babylonians to destroy the temple if the Jews' atonement for sin depended on the ritual of Yom Kippur to have their sins forgiven? Did Yahweh simply forget about whole generations of people who happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, leaving them high and dry? Would a loving God simply cut off the vast majority of humanity without providing a way to get back to him? No, it's not in his nature. 
our relationship with him is the whole point of creation. In and of itself, the Levitical shedding of the blood of bulls and goats was never efficacious in atoning for sins. It was merely a picture, a metaphor, for the coming sacrifice of Yahshua. It's the reality that saves, not the shadow that's cast by that reality. The bottom line, no one was ever reconciled to God except through the blood sacrifice of Yahshua, whether looking forward to the event in faith or back on it again in faith. We don't have to comprehend all the details. It probably isn't even essential that we know his name. As a matter of fact, most people, even Christians, don't know his name. Not really. Jesus is a transliteration of a transliteration of the Greek Iesus, and even that name was not spelled out in any of the pre-Constantinian manuscripts, but instead indicated with a Greek capital initials with a line scribed above them. Jesus is a derivation of the name that has lost 100% of the significance of the Hebrew name God gave him, Yahshua, which means the self-existent one saves. I suppose if you called me Harvey a couple of thousand times, I'd eventually pick up on the idea that you were talking to me and not some invisible six-foot-tall rabbit standing next to me. But my name isn't Harvey, and it never will be. The point is that our faith in and acceptance of God's plan for our reconciliation is what he's interested in, whether we know all the specifics or not, though it seems a crime if we can't even get his name right. The picture he gave us is a valuable teaching aid, but it's still only a picture. Which brings us back to the animal sacrifices in the Millennial Temple. What's the point of doing them if they don't save anyone? The Levitical sacrifices in the Old Testament didn't save anyone either, so the point will be the same as it was back then. They're a picture of God's plan. Remember, there will be billions of mortal men and women walking the earth in the centuries following the tribulation, and if left to their own devices, they will be just as clueless as to the loving intentions of Yahweh as the Jews were in Moses' day, especially since, during the millennium, overt sin will be confronted and dealt with immediately. They will need instruction, guidance, pictures explaining how fallen man can and must be reconciled to God. When their children ask the millennial patriarchs, Why do they kill all those animals up at the temple, Daddy? The door will be open to explaining what Yahshua, the king, did for them the first time he came. Okay, back to Ezekiel's temple tour. Inside the inner courtyard, there were two one-room buildings for the singers, one beside the north gateway, facing south, and the other beside the south gateway, facing north. And the man said to me, The building beside the north inner gate is for the priests who supervise the temple maintenance. The building beside the south inner gate is for the priests in charge of the altar, the descendants of Zadok, for they alone of all the Levites may approach Yahweh to minister to him. Here we begin to see similarities and differences between T4 and T1. As in Solomon's temple, there will be a division of labor between groups of priests and Levites. There are special rooms for the singers and the priests assigned to temple upkeep, for instance. But the hierarchy of the Aaronic priesthood has been redefined. Now only the descendants of Zadok will directly minister before Yahweh. Remember that name. We'll come back to him later. Now we approach the temple itself. Then the man measured the inner courtyard and found it to be 175 feet square. The altar stood there in the courtyard in front of the temple. Then he brought me to the foyer of the temple. He measured its supporting columns and found them to be 8 and 3 quarters feet square. The entrance was 24 and a half feet wide, with walls 5 and a quarter feet thick. The depth of the foyer was 35 feet, and the width was 19 and a quarter feet. There were ten steps leading up to it, with a column on each side. Ezekiel 40, 44 through 49, NLT. 
Even the dimensions tell us something. The outer court, as we saw, is quite large, presumably because it must accommodate many worshippers at one time. But although the entrance to the temple proper is spacious, there is nothing intimidating about it. Its scale is quite human-friendly, which tells us something about the God who designed it. He is far more concerned about relating to us than he is about impressing us. After that, the man brought me into the holy place, the large main room of the temple, and he measured the columns that framed its doorway. They were ten and a half feet square. The entrance was seventeen and a half feet wide, and the walls on each side were eight and three quarters feet wide. The holy place itself was seventy feet long and thirty-five feet wide. The holy place then is accessed through a seventeen and a half foot wide opening at the back of, and almost the entire nineteen and a quarter foot width of, a thirty-five foot long foyer. Then he went into the inner room at the end of the holy place. He measured the columns at the entrance and found them to be three and a half feet thick. The entrance was ten and a half feet wide, and the walls on each side of the entrance extended twelve and a quarter feet. To the corners of the inner room, the inner room was thirty-five feet square. This, he told me, is the most holy place. The floor plan is generally like Solomon's temple and the tabernacle that preceded it, but with the addition of the foyer. T four may be slightly larger in scale than T one, thirty-five feet in width, as opposed to thirty feet, due solely to the implied difference in the length of the cubit, the standard eighteen-inch cubit of Solomon, versus the cubit and a handbreadth or Hebrew long cubit specified in Ezekiel. Actually, though, both records call for a width of twenty cubits, and there's a raging controversy among scholars about the precise length of the cubit Solomon used. So we really don't know. The first version of all this, the wilderness tabernacle, was ten cubits wide and high. It was basically a half-scale prototype for the permanent temple. Then he measured the wall of the temple and found that it was ten and a half feet thick. There was a row of rooms along the outside wall. Each room was seven feet wide. These rooms were built in three levels, one above the other, with thirty rooms on each level. The supports for these rooms rested on ledges in the temple wall, but the supports did not extend into the wall. Each level was wider than the one below it, corresponding to the narrowing of the temple wall as it rose higher. A stairway led up from the bottom level. Through the middle level to the top level, this seems to be saying that the alcoves in the walls were to be deeper as the levels ascended, making the inner supporting wall thinner at each level. This is our first hint as to the height of the temple, three stories. Again, not terribly impressive as religious buildings go, but rather one designed on a human scale, a reflection of Yahweh's desire for intimacy with us. I noticed that the temple was built on a terrace, which provided a foundation for the side rooms. This terrace was ten and a half feet high. The outer wall of the temple's side rooms was eight and three quarters feet thick. This left an open area between these side rooms and the row of rooms along the outer wall of the inner courtyard. This open area measured thirty-five feet in width, and it went all the way around the temple. Two doors opened from the side rooms into the terrace yard, which was eight and three quarters feet wide. One door faced north, and the other south. From the viewpoint of the courtyard, then the temple would appear at least four stories high. It could, of course, be taller. A large building stood in the west, facing the temple courtyard. It was a hundred and twenty-two and a half feet wide and a hundred and fifty-seven and a half feet long. And its walls were eight and three quarters feet thick. Then the man measured the temple, and he found it to be a hundred and seventy-five feet long. The courtyard around the building, including its walls, was an additional a hundred and seventy-five feet in length. The inner courtyard to the east of the temple was also a hundred and seventy-five feet wide. The building to the west, including its two walls, was also one hundred and seventy-five feet wide. 
As we shall see in Ezekiel chapter 42, the temple was flanked on the north and south sides with three-story outbuildings located outside the inner courtyard. But this large building was situated out back, that is, to the west. The only door to the temple proper faced east.